feet. Let's celebrate. Hallelujah. Come on and clap your hands. Go. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, we do. 
worship you, we adore you. We lift our hands, Father. Lift your hands all over this building. It's all right to worship him. Hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We worship you, Jesus. I lift my hands. I lift my hands. Yes, we do. It's total adoration comes to you. And you reign upon the throne. You reign on the throne. For you are God and God alone. Because of you, my cloudy days are gone. Yes, God. And I can sing to you this song. I can sing to you. Song. I just want to tell you. Let's do that verse again. I lift my hands. Yes, I, I do. Lift my hands in total
somebody next to you, if you would stand, grab their hand, we're going to pray. Amen. Amen. How many of you know God is, is worthy not only of our praise, but for us to cry mm. and tell them how much we do love him? Mm. Anybody love Jesus in this place? Yes. 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 Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We honor you. There's no one like you. Lord, we do love you more than anything. We tried many different things and chased after stuff we shouldn't have, and yet we found all the time you were right there with us. So, God, we come this morning saying thank you. You pressed the cold with that little weeks that have had trials and tribulations, but, God, we know that you love us and you've walked with us every step of the way. You've kept us, and that's how we made it to this place today. Lord, thank you for your sovereignty, but most of all, thank you for your love for us. Your word says, God, we love you because you first loved us. Thank you for your love and admiration of us, your children. Despite our wayward ways and our flaws and our faults, you still love us. And so, God, we come today just to say thank you for your majestic and all-consuming love. It's in Christ's name we pray. Let us all say together, Amen. 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 You may take your seats if you would, please. Uh, for those of you, whether it's your Bible or your phone or your iPad or however you read God's Word, if you will turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We're going to continue talking about fruitfulness. And today we're going to find love biblically. And as you're going there in your Bibles, your iPads, your phones, however you read God's Word, we got about a hundred, no, not even a hundred, about 90 seconds, but I want to pose a room and ask you, when you hear the word love, give me one, give me one word that comes to mind, that defines it for you. What is love to you? Come on, quick, 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 quick. Peace. Grace. Peace. What else? Grace. Unconditional. Unconditional. What else? Trust. Trust. Family. What else? Patience. Okay. Peace. Patience. Yes, 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 yes. All of these things and more make up love, and we're going to look at it from a biblical standpoint this morning. Mm -hmm. If you missed last week, please go out to our website uh, or download our app and pull up what we're going to be talking about all of Galatians 5. We're going to move around today, so please keep your Bible and your phone out as we walk around these <coughs> pillars of, if you will, of God's love which was shown to us manifested in Jesus when he incarnated and came to earth to save us. Amen. Galatians chapter 5. We'll read these first few verses together and because it's cold I'm going to give you a break and let you sit and read. Because <laughs> I know some of y'all still trying to unthaw. Amen. Amen. What did you ever do? Our ancestors didn't have heat. They had coal and wood stoves. And you had to be close to the stove. That's what my dad told me. He's from the south. He said you, you had siblings. You had to fight about who was close to the to the to the fire. And, and he was the youngest, so guess what? He stayed cold a lot. Mm. He got elbowed out. What did you ever do before you could get heat through some vents? Mm. Something to think about. You don't really recognize sometimes how blessed you really are. Amen. 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 Before you got a window, because some houses back then didn't have windows. I know, some of y'all, I just lost you right there. <laughs> you thinking Jesus underneath your skin, talking about, thank you for making sure I was born in the 21st century. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. We're going to read together on the count of three. It means you're going to read with me, all right? Read whatever translation you have. Let's go. One, two, three. Well, you were called to free. To free. Start that old. Stop, stop, stop. 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 Mm -mm. You ain't that cold. We're going to try this again. Starting at verse 13. Ready, set, go. For well, you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. Keep going. Amen. Amen. We're going to walk through these 
seven things, but we're going to start right here in Galatians chapter 5. As we mentioned last week, Galatians, Paul was writing to a group of folk who made up the church. Watch this. A church that had issues. One, they had redemptive error issues because they tried to layer on top of Christ's finished work on the cross more for someone to do. They had ethnicity issues because they figured you should get like us in order to be saved rather than understanding that no one had to become like them to be saved. They were saved because they accepted Jesus. And then lastly, legalistic. They had more rules than anybody could ever imagine. So how can you keep them all if you've never known them all? And so here Paul is breaking down something uh, to them in this chapter about freedom. And so the first thing we're going to see, and I want you to grab this, and if you're a note taker, you can write it down, or if you're a person who uses your phone, you can put notes in your phone. But here's what I want you to see this morning. The first thing is love is action. Action. Love is an action word. Look back at this. He's, it talks about what that action makes up. Verse 13, for you were called to freedom, brother, meaning we are free. We have liberty. You have freedom. You have choice. The greatest and sometimes the most challenging thing God ever gave us and blessed us with is choice. Because when you have choices, that means you get to decide what you do and don't do. And watch this. You get to decide it oftentimes without any guidance. So he says, you're free. You're free. He says, but don't turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Can I deal with that word serve for a minute? This is going to mess you up as we're headed into Black History Month. That word serve comes from a root word in Greek, doulos, which means slave. In other words, when we love one another in the body of Christ, this is for believers, watch this, we become slaves to one another. Mm, how did that make you feel? We are called, a way to show our love and action is to become slaves to one another, which means not only do you highly esteem your neighbor or the, rather your fellow Christian brother or sister more than yourself, but you do whatever it takes to serve them well even when they're difficult to serve. Even if you don't like them that much. Even if you don't know them. Because let's be real. Can we be honest for a moment? How many of you know your degree of service sometimes goes according to how well you know a person? The more you know them, the closer you feel to them, the more you seem willing to do. Vice versa, if you don't know them that well, they got to go through a litmus test first. I'll do a little bit and see how you respond, okay, you worthy of a little more service, or no, 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 I ain't going to, no, no. Reverend, don't pray me up with them no more, no. That's how a pastor know when he in trouble. He ain't pastor no more, he reverend. Don't, no, don't pray me up with them. But Paul says part of our liberty is to then be licensed to be slaves to one another. Let's pause for a minute and talk about that. How many of you know that word slave in itself make your skin boil? Yes. But let me help you for a moment. The word slave in this context, first century Palestine, was not slave what we know today. A slave in that day and age was an agreement between two parties where somebody had a debt to somebody and you needed to work off your debt. And then once you worked off your debt, you were considered free and you could live and go as you choose. It was not barbaric. It was not evil and wicked like we know slavery to be as it has been to our ancestors. But yet, Christ says through Paul in this text, if we're going to love each other well and love is an action word, that means I become a slave to you and you become a slave to me and we're going to love each other well by how we serve one another. How many of you still say that make your skin boil? That just, that, that just, ain't, that just ain't, ain't working out for you because it sums it up in verse 14. He says in this one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. How many of you know you love yourself? Okay, now how many of you feel that same love for your neighbor? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> how many of you know your love got conditions? Now, didn't I just ask you what some words is for love? How many of y'all said unconditional, 
peace and all of that. But now we done got the verse 14. We two minutes in and all of a sudden love got conditions. How many of you know for you that's why love don't live here no more? Because they didn't meet the conditions. <laughs> They, they, just, they just blew them conditions out of the water. Love is over. Case closed. Ain't going to be no love under new management. It's a wrap. But the Bible says, for those of you watching online and you may still be at home in your uh, PJs, let me help you for a moment. Let me unravel you for a moment. The Bible says in order for us to be known for love, Watch this. We have to love our neighbors just like we love us, which means the same treatment we give to ourselves, we got to be willing to give to our neighbor. The same unconditional grace and mercy that we want for ourselves, we have to be willing to give to our neighbors. And it's not based on any conditions that they do anything to get it. It's just that we're to give it to them because that then makes us Christ-like, meaning Christians, and separates us from the rest of the world. Now, how many of you know on your own strip that's not something you can do? That's why I believe <coughs> the Lord led Paul to write that in verse 22 of chapter 5 to be the first part of the fruit of the Spirit. Because it takes God's Spirit living in us to love that way. Because if all of us are honest, all of us got some folk we love better than others, more deeper than others, and watch this. Some of us got somebody on a list somewhere that I don't care what they do because of what they did. There ain't no love no more. Silence. Because that's a difficult thing to work through. But the Bible tells us love is an action word. So if God's spirit lives in us, that means he's going to work out a way for us to somehow watch this love them again. Let me deal with the word love here throughout what you hear me when I say the word love. It's agape. It's not a, uh, uh, a relational love in terms of romantic type love. It is a godly love. It is a sincere, watch this, care and deep admiration and honor for one another. That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about Eros. I know we get close to Valentine's Day. We ain't talking about that. We're talking about a godly love that says, even though you've done some things to wound me, I still love you. So that's what Paul is talking about here. He says, verse 15, and then we're going to move. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. In other words, he said, you're free. And I know what's happening in this church. He's saying to the uh, church at Galatia, I know some of y'all attacking one another because you're free now. Because you've accepted Christ, you've used it as a liberty. Watch this to get in. And then to say, well, God, I love enough to make sure that I repent after I do what I want to do in my flesh. <clears throat> but what God is saying is, no, that's not how that works. You have to love unconditionally despite what the conditions may be. Because <clears throat> love is an action word. Say that with me. Love is an action word. Okay, here is part two then. Since we're dealing with that, and now I already done probably got on one of your nerves, let's go to John chapter 13, starting at verse 34. John 13, starting at verse 34. this. Not only love is an action word, but it's not a one-time action. It is active. Meaning it's on going. On going. Active. <coughs> and when John writes this incidentally, he is following the steps of Jesus as Jesus is making his move to Calvary to die for our sins. And Jesus is doing this final display of teaching to his disciples. And as he's teaching his disciples, he's trying to impart in them some foundational truths that will keep them long after he is gone. 
So verse 34 says this, a new commandment I give to you that I, that you love one another even, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We see this standard and we see this sign. Love is active. It says essentially that if you want to love well, watch this, it will show by how you love one another. He's talking to them as disciples, which means he's speaking to us as the church first. He says you can't love anybody outside of the walls until you love someone inside the wall. Meaning there has to be a care for one another around right where you are. In other words, you have to watch this. Stay intentional because the standard is to love each other as Christians as Christ has loved us. So when you think about Jesus' love for you, what are some words that come to mind? Throw something out at me. Throw something out at me. Unconditional. There it is. Hold on to that. What else? Grace. Everlasting. What else? Steady. What else? Sacrificial. What else? Selflessness. What else? Genuine. Now those are some very powerful and some very real and some very true words. And here it is. This is how Jesus is saying we are to love one another. So now let's be honest about this thing. Do you love other brothers and sisters in Christ that way? Why not? What happens? Let's talk. Let's be real. Humanity, what else? Come on, don't mumble and say it out loud. Don't be scared. Ego, what else? Gossip, yeah, what else? Selfishness. I'm all I got. You want me to put my trust, my life in your hands? I ain't even willing to put my sandwich in your hands. <laughs> what else stands in the way of us loving each other like that? Hurt. Friendship. Let's deal with that word hurt. How I many has anybody ever been wounded by trying to love and care for a person? Mm. And how many of you know that makes you want to shut down when that happens? How many of you right now, be honest, you got walls up around you like a fortress because you've been hurt? And then the moment you peek out from around the wall, something else happens. So what you do, you add another brick. And the reality of it is, here's what happens. The more barriers we build, the harder it is to love each other the way God intended to. Because if I got a wall up, I can't see you, you can't see me. So how are we going to love one another? But Jesus is talking to his intimate circle to say to them, if this thing going to keep moving, if the church is going to keep being the church, watch this. You have to love one another the same as I have loved you, which means you have to be selfless with some people who are selfish. It means you have to be unconditional with some people you want conditions and terms on. It means, watch this, you have to give more of yourself even if they don't give back because that's the way love stays active. And then he closes it out and says this at the end of the thing, the sign by which people will know that you mind is by the way you love one another. Now here's an interesting question, and then we're going to move. I'm going to leave you alone. But uh, how well do you think people think of the church now based off how they see us love one another? Don't that make you think for a second? And I'm not talking about just the surfacey stuff, although it's true, the gossip and, you know, the challenges of, of life and, and dealing with people and wondering if, if, you know, I can share something in confidence with somebody without the whole world knowing our business. But I'm talking about deeper issues, stuff like, uh, uh, Lord, um, I don't know that I want to be around them because they mean, they evil, they never smile, they never happy, there's no joy, there's no peace. They say all that stuff, but uh, I work with them. And I get the real them, not their Sunday representative. And so I don't know that I really want to become a part of that 
And so the church struggling today because people haven't seen us love each other well. They seen us argue. They seen us decide who we gonna help and who we not. They seen us develop little clubs within the whole church. And so if you don't fit my club, then I won't associate with you. But they haven't seen us love each other well. So let me pick at you one more time. How, what's some, real quick, 60 seconds, what's some things we can do to love each other better? Help each other, respect, what else? Communication, what else? Serve. Listen. Mm. Empathize. Now let me help you for a moment. All of this is great. You do know you're being recorded, right? <laughs> so that means when I play this back and say, I want y'all to love each other, y'all say, we don't know what that means. I'm going to let this roll. I'm going to hear empathy. I'm going to hear communication. I'm going to hear sir. You ain't going to have spiritual amnesia, are you? Mm, mm, mm. So I'm going I'm to I'm drive this a little deeper. Go, go, go to John now, chapter 15. Because not only is love action and active, but love is assertive. It's assertive. It, it, it asserts itself into things. You don't believe that? Let me, let me give an illustration as you go to John 15, starting at verse 4 real quickly. Um, as a parent, you, you want to see... Uh, a mother or a father's love do something to their child. And see how quick they assert themselves into the circumstance. They ain't going to ask permission. They're they not going to talk to you and say, let's negotiate. But if they feel something is going on with their child, they're going to jump in it. They're going to take over the child's phone, computer, iPad, car, whatever needs to happen. And then you can buck if you want to and say, you take it over my space. They're not going to answer that because love asserts itself. And so in John 15, we're going to see real quick where Jesus now tells us how he asserts himself. Check this out real quick. Uh, starting at verse 4, it says this. It says, abide in me and I in you. And as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit for apart from me, you can do nothing. That word abide is an imperative, which means it's a command. Jesus is saying you stick with me because if you stick with me, you get all the nutrients and everything you need so that you can watch this. Be who I've called you to be. Jesus says, I'm asserting myself into your life because you've accepted me as Savior. So what does that mean? You have to accept what he says is true. And I dig deeper for a moment. Because some of us got our own truth. Stuff like, where I'm from, hey, you, you talk to me sideways. <laughs> or stuff like this. Well, you know, um, you, you got to pass these hurdles before I'll even let you come close to me. Because that's what mama said and that's what Grandma and them did, so that's how I behave. But Jesus says, if you abide in me and I in you, all of a sudden your behavior, your, your, your interactions, your everything begins to shift and change over time. It don't happen overnight. But he says, I shift how you think and how you move because I am the one who produced in you. Apart from me, you can't produce, but connected to me, you can do everything, which means you can love somebody who's difficult to love. You can care for people you don't really like. You can serve those who really don't appreciate your service. You can give to those who don't deserve your giving. You can watch this, take care of them, even though you know if the shoe was on the other foot, they probably wouldn't do it. And can we be honest for a moment, what makes abiding Jesus so tough is, is because sometimes it seems like Jesus allows people to throw darts at us and we can't throw none back. <laughs> can we be honest? Have you ever thought to yourself, God, do you see what they're doing? 
I've been sitting on my hands. I'm praying, but I don't know how much more prayer I got. Okay. Y'all, y'all, you, 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 you want me to believe? Okay. Who I need to go get sitting next to you that you don't like so I can see your real you? <laughs> Have you ever had somebody sit next to you and instantly your skin begins to crawl because you already feel a certain kind of way about it? And you can't believe they had the audacity to sit next to you. Audacity. The nerve of them. But Jesus says, when you abide in me, you can do all things. Notice how we'll quote Philippians 4.13 in Christ, I can do all things when it's something we want to do. But do you quote it when it's something Jesus what you want, what Jesus wants you to do that don't line up with your agenda? When he says abide in me and bear much fruit, he's talking to them. They're getting ready to go through some things. They're getting ready to be disliked. They're getting ready to be people who are sought after. Not only when he dies on the cross, but even after he rises on the third day and ascends back to heaven, he's leaving them behind and they're going to be despised. And he's saying, yeah, you got to remain in me when life gets hard, when life gets difficult, because my love, I've asserted myself in your life and my love will carry you through. Now, let's be real. How many of you go, yeah, that sound real good, Jesus, but uh, you, you ain't been where I've been. But can I tell you that's why he came to earth? That's why he can be assertive because Jesus says this essentially. I can do this and tell you to do this because I've been tempted in every way like you have, but yet I'm without sin. That's why he says I can say to you like I do on John in chapter 15 verse 9, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. Notice he tells us to abide in his love because he understands without his love we can't do this. You do understand what we're talking about here. It takes supernatural ability that can only come through his spirit living in us. This is not something we're wired to do on our own. Now, here's my favorite one. So, we see that love is action, active, assertive. Love is affirming. If you would, everybody, please turn here. Go to 1 Corinthians 13. Some of you probably know this by heart. Some of this may have had, some of you may have had this said on your wedding day. Love is patient. Love is kind. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. Anybody have that said on your wedding day? Hmm. Interesting. Anybody ever heard it said at a wedding? Hmm. Verse 14. Y'all said it earlier, love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. Hmm. It does not seek its own, hmm. is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Hmm. Can I tell you, I'm going to be transparent for a moment, I was good with Jesus until I read that part. Because I got real good counting skills. And my issue is, where I have to work through is, I keep a count when you do something to me. I know I'm probably by myself this morning. That's okay. I'll lay on the altar after all y'all gone. <laughs> but my struggle is, I don't forget when you do something to me. I got an account with your name on it. John, on this day, dot, 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 dot. So when you come ask me, to do, or to give, or to listen, I'm going to say, John, your account with me is 150 negative. I can't help you. You're you going to have to get some positive credit. Because I ain't never been to a bank when you're in the negative and they still give you money. Now, I know that ain't some of y'all struggle, but I'm going to tell you that's mine. But God says, here's what love affirms. It don't keep a record. Love says it's like it never happened. Now I just lost half of y'all. <laughs> because you're looking at me like, Pastor, that, mm -mm, no, 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 you don't know what they did. I remember the day and the time it was cold, and uh, they said, and they was big, bad then <clears throat> in public. 
But Pastor, you should have seen what happened when I got him in pride. How many of you know you keep a count wrong? Let's just be honest. I used to. When I first read this, being <laughs> transparent, there were a couple of files in my house I had to go get rid of because it was work stuff and I had a person who was just after me in a certain kind of way and I kept a file of all the file stuff they ever said through email because if one day I was just going to drop it on somebody's desk and let them have it. Have it. <laughs> I know you ain't never done like that. You ain't never investigated a situation and built up enough evidence. Some of y'all know y'all better than the same little <laughs> folks detective department. <laughs> but I did, and I read that, and I, when it really got a hold of me, I understood what God was saying because of what he did for us, and because he doesn't keep no record of our wrongs, he says, my perfect love, 1 John 4, cast out fear, therefore I wipe out your wrongs, and your faults and the times you've done me wrong, so therefore you got to wipe theirs out. I get that, God, because you God. I ain't you. I ain't never, God, I ain't never claimed to be you, so therefore, because you wipe something out, don't mean I do. But God says, if we're going to love, and love is affirming, we can't keep a record of wrong. But here's the real weight of the matter. It says this, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, verse 6, but rejoices with the truth. Have you ever been happy because somebody failed you didn't like? <laughs> Y'all ain't being honest today. <laughs> Have you ever, deep down, you, you watched them stumble and fall. You saw them make get away with stuff. You seen them get over on people. You seen them treat people bad. And it seemed like nothing ever happened to them. Then all of a sudden, one day, it all caught up with them. And you were able to just see a glimpse of it. You ain't never get happy. A little bit. And go, ooh, yeah, you thought you was all that, didn't you? Look at you. Ain't all that now, are you? <laughs> Incidentally, I, 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 I've seen something like that happen. And, 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 and I happened to ride past the person, and they were really down on their luck after doing a bunch of wrong stuff to wrong, to wrong people in the, in the worst kind of way. And when I saw them, I thought to myself, ha, ha. <laughs> you getting what you deserve. And, and at that moment, I felt God saying, there's somebody you need to help. What? Mm. They done did their family wrong. They done did me wrong. They done did all kind of wrong. To me, they getting what's right. I wish. No. <laughs> what's right is to love them and serve them. What? Because love keeps no count of wrong. Oh! That means some of the worst offenses we've ever experienced, God says, they get wiped out <coughs> because of love. Can you handle that? <coughs> How many of you know you need some growth in that? There's nothing wrong with being honest. But can I tell you that's the standard? And that's why it takes God's spirit living in us. Because there's certain people we can look at and instantly what they did pops right back up in front of us. And in the immediate moment, we got a decision to make. Either A, I'm going to totally ignore you. Because if I approach you, I just might go there. Because all of a sudden you begin to feel something that you didn't even know was still there. Or B, I, I run to you and just do something to you. Because I'm still hurting and I'm still wounded. And or C, I allow God to guide me in how I approach you. Paul is saying to the Corinthian church who was wrapped up in gifts and wrapped up in fighting and backbiting and gossiping and all these different things. Here's what love does. It affirms. It does this. It holds you together. And then he closes it out. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Oh, did I tell you what all means? Oh, everything. Now you see why I caution couples, do you really want to read this at your wedding day? <laughs> Because at best, y'all done known each other a couple of years, and now you're talking about a lifetime together. Are you really ready to endure all things? Hmm. 
When that joker come home and you know he sideways and wrong, are you ready to not keep a count? something and you know that it wouldn't have got broke if she would have just left it alone but right. she was going to do it anyway right. because she know what she doing because she know all things because she woman she know all things just like Jesus until it fell apart uh -huh. honey we got a problem preach Are you still willing to endure all things, love all things, bear all things? Uh-oh. How many of you know sometimes it just takes the right thing to happen before them conditions come back? It's okay to look at me. It's all right. But Paul says this love is affirming. This love really can hold and bear and go the test of time because it's not based on us. It's based on who God is working through us. A couple more and I'm out of your way. Love is an attitude. So not only is it an action, it's active and it's assertive and it's affirming. But love is an attitude. You don't have to go there, but Deuteronomy chapter 4 and 5 it's the Shema. It's what Jewish people, even today, twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, repeat, the Lord our God is one. It was them proclaiming that in the midst of a pagan society where you have multiple, watch this, gods in their world, that we have the one true living God. And because we have the one true living God, we will then love him with all our heart, mind, and soul. That's verse 5. Of Deuteronomy. It's a mindset. It's an attitude. It says, I'm going to give God everything. I'm going to give God all of me. Now, let's be honest. How many of you know God don't have all of you? I would suggest that it's all of us. There is a portion of us that we know that we're holding on to because it's a vulnerable spot. It's a place where it's some deep things there. And God says, I want to work through that. I want to root that out. We're saying, no, God, I'm going to hold on to that. But love is an attitude. It's a mindset. It says, I'm going to give it all to you, God, because I trust you. I trust that you can handle my hurts. I trust that you can handle my pains. I trust that you can handle whatever the conditions and circumstances of my life are. So love says, I'm going to give God all of me. Incidentally, in Hebrew culture, the word love, and when it says all heart, it's not talking about emotions. Heart in Hebrew culture meant intellect. Meaning I'm going to give them all my mind. Soul dealt with more of our emotions. I say this often because I see this happen. Um, people get into a conflict. Somebody mentioned one of the things that are true about love is communication. Uh, love, watch this, doesn't make feelings facts. You can feel a thing. That don't mean it's true. Uh-oh. But you don't understand, you weren't there, and you can't tell me how to feel. I ain't trying to tell you how to feel. But what I am trying to tell you is that sometimes with God, feelings ain't fact. Meaning I can feel that I was done wrong, but God says the fact of the matter is I was shaping and doing something in you. You weren't done wrong, you were just being developed by me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you may feel like this is the end and it's unjust. And God says what was unjust was my son dying on the cross. What you're going through is a minor affliction. These light afflictions, which last but for a moment, work a four more exceeding weight of glory. God says it ain't what you think it is. Sometimes feelings and facts are not the same and sometimes they are. But he says the way to deal with that is, is to keep a mindset of giving him all of us. All. All. A song this artist I like, John Legend, has a song, you know, Give Me All of You and I'll Give You All of Me. Good song. But when you pull it back, I can attest and say to you, it takes people a lifetime, even those who are in marriage, to get to a place where it's all. We release in layers. 
The more I trust you, the more of you I get. Can we be honest? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The more I get to know you, okay, I'll let you in a little bit more and a little bit more. And then, uh-oh, we hit a stumbling block because you did something, so now I got to big back up. But God says, what I want is all of you from the beginning. Because when you give me all of you, there's so many amazing things I can do in your life when I've got all your trust. Mm -hmm. So love, watch this as an attitude. Second to last one, let's go here. I want you to read this. Go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 43, because love is an antidote. Love is an antidote. It will help you and help me deal with whatever life brings. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. I'm going to read this out loud. Just keep this in your hand. It says, you have heard it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Mm -mm. I'm going to read that again because I don't think some of y'all heard that. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who who persecute you. Love your enemies and pray for those who love and pray for an enemy. The reason why love is an antidote is because it gives you a way to deal with people who are not only mean and evil and wicked, but it gives us a way through of how to care for them. Um, How many of you have ever prayed for an enemy? Is that not a hard thing to do? Did the prayer go something like this, Lord, fix them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Lord, do you see how evil and wicked they are? Do you see what they've done? Lord, it ain't right. Correct them. Anybody want to open up a psalm like David? David says stuff in the psalms like, basically, Lord, kill them. Vindicate me. What Jesus is talking about is not necessarily a prayer to fix them, but rather, Lord, to change their hearts. Because he's concerned about us caring for people's souls, even when they're enemies. Care about where they spend eternity, even when they persecute us, pray for them that they would understand that they're really not wounding us, that they're wounding God. Okay, now I'm going to ask a question again. How many of you have ever really prayed for an enemy? Did it feel like an out of body experience? Because you got to understand something. Life, watch this, not only brings friends, it brings enemies. It brings betrayal. It brings hurt. It brings gossip. And God says the way to do it is to love them through it. Love them through it. On, on one part of scripture, it says if you're an enemy and you know they're an enemy, you go to Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 9, it talks about serve them. It talks about feeding them. It talks about caring for them. Wait a minute. They're an enemy and you want me to invite them to eat with me? Think about that for a moment. Have you ever invited somebody over for dinner you didn't like? I'm praying, because I, I ain't there yet, because I only let certain people in my house anyway. I can like you, and you can still never come to my house. Let's be real. Everybody don't get to come through the front door. But on top of that, you want me, Jesus, you saying to me, invite them over. Can we start outside first? Can we meet at Starbucks or something? Maybe. But he says, serve them well. But because by us as Christians serving and loving our enemies well, we heap coals on their head. In other words, we show to the world 
that we don't belong to ourselves, but that we belong to a master and a savior who can carry us through some of the most difficult circumstances because of love. You see now, the biblical definition of love is not this cute, fluffy stuff. I think in the world today we use the word love too loosely. We, we love everything. And what I believe when we're saying we love, oftentimes what we're really saying is we like. Come home. Oh, I think I'm in love. I'm, I don't even, I, it's been a month, but it's true love. Really? <laughs> You don't, you don't, you, you probably don't even know their last name yet. <laughs> How could you possibly say you in love? I met a man once, right before he passed. I mean, his wife was married 66 years. I had to ask him, How do you do it? How, how do you stay together 66 years, ups and downs, illnesses, sickness, kids? grandkids, great-grandkids, out of the depression, into all the different things. And he said, the only thing that will keep you that intentionally focused is a deep love for God first that gives you the strength to love your spouse with. And give me some cute, fluffy answer. Because he said, some days, Y'all don't like each other, and some days y'all ain't gonna stand each other. And he said, not just only in your marriage, but there are gonna be people in your life who some days you just can't stand, who seem to be disruptive and divisive and do not care about your well being. And it's only because of how you love God that you can love other people. He says, you have to keep bringing them back into your life. He was talking about loving enemies. He said, you have to keep bringing people you don't like back into your life. Not to be friends with them, but to show that you love them. I said, what does that mean? Because some relationships to me are just not healthy and need to be cut off. He said, absolutely. But he said, when their name comes up, how do you respond? He said, how do you act if you see them from afar? He said, if you still have something in you that wants to go do something to them, you've got to go back to the drawing board and seek God about how to love them well. Now, that stuck with me because I found the truthful and profound, but yet it challenged me because I need to grow because I don't know that I love in that way. But Jesus, in essence, gives it as the antidote to some bad teaching that has happened when he does the Sermon on the Mount. It says, if you want to be like me, then you got to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But here's the last one, and I'm done. Love also is adoption. God adopts us into his family. God chooses us. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that him all might be saved. God says, I'm adopting you. I'm choosing you. Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. God the Father in his infinite wisdom before the very foundations of the world predestined us to be his. He adopted us. I was reading this book, Adopted by God, by a man named Dr. Peterson, who I had his class in seminary. But he talked about this young man who had been adopted, and this is how he described it. He said he couldn't understand why him out of multiple siblings he had multiple siblings. They had lived in bad conditions. He said one foster family they lived with, the foster family had them eaten out of bowls on the floor like they were animals. And he said they all prayed and wanted to get out and get to a loving family. That's all they ever wanted. And he said out of all his siblings, out of all the pictures being shown of them, he was the only one that was picked. And he said, as a result of him being picked, his life looked totally different. He was married when the book was written. He had children. He had a thriving career. And he said his other siblings had all kind of challenges and issues in life going on because they never left the foster care system. And he says, my experience being adopted by a human family 
highlights the fact that God looked at us in our condition and how bad we were and how broken we were and how vulnerable we are and decided to love us anyway and chose us when other people wouldn't choose us. So love, watch this, is then a choice to come alongside and say, I'm going to do this anyway. I'm going to love you anyway. I sum it up this way. Have you ever seen two people together and you go, wow, this person is sweet as pie. How in the world? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did they end up with this person? You ain't never seen that? Like, I, I've been out in stores and... And I'm looking, I'm going, what made you? What kind of spell did they cast over you? Right. This mean, grouchy, unkind, and yet the person loves them. That's the kind of love that God showed us. He decided, he made a choice, and he asked us, to allow his spirit to dwell in us to make the same kind of choice, to love people the same. <coughs> I close with this. I, last week read again Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from a Birmingham jail. And he breaks down in there a whole bunch of stuff. But one of the things he said is that he had been called an extremist for not being patient in some people's minds in his fight for justice. And he said, well, if I'm an extremist, then I'm an extremist just like they said Jesus was an extremist. Because Jesus, and then he began to list these things, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, bless those who despitefully harm and try and do wicked to you. He said, if I'm going to be an extremist of love, then I'm going to follow suit of being like Jesus. I would suggest that the kind of love that the Bible talks about, that for those of us who have accepted Jesus, that's the kind of love it's calling us to. Now, I know that makes all kind of questions fly. Like, uh, so when somebody does do me wrong, do they just get a pass? Or when do I end something? When do I say enough is enough? Do I not have boundaries? Jesus had boundaries. But he didn't start with his boundaries. Can we be real before we pray and close? Most of us, when it comes to love, we start with our boundaries first. Here's my marker right here. Here's my wall. I might build a peak hole and look through it. And you're going to have to earn your way for me to tear down my wall. Jesus started with love first. Can I tell you where this is going? Because if we're going to love well and reach people for him well, mm -hmm. that means we have to be willing to love people where they are. Amen. Which means they might not come in dressed like you, smell like you, look like you, or I, or do what we think they should. Because love is patient. Love doesn't put people on the timetable to say, you need to get right by this day or I'm done. Now, can you see why biblical love is so difficult? But yet, easy to be done when we allow God to be the one to guide it. Because it takes us beyond us. You got somebody next to you. Take that hand. Here's what I know. <laughs> because when you start talking about love on this level, it throws up all kind of flags. It brings back memories. Some good, some not so good. challenges us. Before we pray, how many of you feel challenged? Like, ooh. Let's pray. Father, we 
thank you for being who you are and for caring the way you care. But most of all, we thank you for your love, which is unconditional, which is true, which is right, which is pure, which reigns over anything we've ever known. Mm. Now help us through the guidance of the Holy mm. Spirit to live out love mm. the way you intended. Mm. For us to care for each other well, love mm. each other well, that mm. we may be a sign to the world that we are yours mm. for how we care and mm. love one another. Mm. Then, Lord, let that love spill over to how we love our neighbor. A neighbor is anyone who is around us, a co-worker, a friend, a family member. And then, may you give us what we need, the strength, the guidance, the courage, the confidence, to trust you, to guide us, to love people the way you intended for us to love. Then, God, let us be reminded of how much you love us and what you went through just to save us. And how you never let us go because we are yours. We cannot be plucked out of your hand. Thank you for not only your love being an assurance, but let, thank you for allowing it to be an anchor that grips and holds us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Let us all say together, amen. amen. Let's put our hands together. Amen.